Today we're doing um, a, one of our famous, famous, uh, famous is Good, a phrase man. I like to toss around. It's sure. not even a fucking phrase, it's a word. Yeah. On Double Feature, um, when we pretend that we have a fan base. Uh, we're doing one of our famous director-centric episodes, and I'm gonna, I'll am gonna, i take all the blame. This director-centric <laughs> blame, this episode is, is unapologetically... What notable director have we not yet covered <laughs> that you want to do on, uh, on today's show? The... Um, brilliant mind of one tom holland watch out tom holland fans we're gonna spoil the films <laughs> uh we're gonna spoil thinner i can't say anything about it yet because yeah. we're gonna spoil it yeah no, the we're title's gonna spoil, a spoiler gonna spoil the original 80s fright Nights. right now we shot ourselves in the foot with tom holland stuff because we didn't do child's play well we did or we do did child's. but we can't yeah, do right. it again um, yeah we can you yeah. want to just do it right now? Yeah, maybe we'll do it instead. No, you know what? How about we do that, and if you don't want to hear Child's Play again, you can just chapter right on over to Thinner. I think we'll start with Thinner, and okay. then do Fright Night, and not do Child's Play at all. Let's all right. stick to that plan. That, that was a good, like a good plan. idea. With Thinner, the first person I wanted to talk about was Richard Bachman. But Richard I don't Bachman. know. I don't know how much, how much, if any, Richard Bachman you know? I don't know much, if any. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. This is great. Okay, so... Richard Bachman is the guy who wrote the novel Thinner, which may it may give you a, perhaps a quizzical look. Yeah, you have a quizzical yeah, look. Yeah, my brow has become furrowed. Yeah, right. So you might recognize Thinner as being written by somebody else. I You were going to toss a name out here? I was. I was going to spew forth and double features, um, double sleepy nap times yeah. champion Stephen King. <laughs> you know, and last time we did Stephen King... I wanted to come on today's show and say we didn't give him a fair shake and we're doing Thinner to, yeah. <laughs> to rectify that, but come on now. Um, Stephen King did write Thinner, but he wrote it under a pseudonym. Oh. Uh, so this was a cool thing that, you know, some artists have, have gone on to do this. I think uh, The Prodigy did this, and it's, it's not an original Stephen King idea by any means. But one of the coolest things, so here we go, we get to talk about a really cool Stephen King thing. Uh, one of the coolest fucking things Stephen King ever did. So he got really killer hedges. He got really famous, and then there was a point in his career where he went, "Man, all of my books are just gonna sell like fucking hotcakes, no matter what I do. I wonder if I'm actually a good author, or <laughs> people just buy any shit I spew out." So he decided, "All right, I'm going to uh, I'm gonna release books under a pseudonym." Because um, people aren't going to buy more than one of my books a mm -hmm. year. Anyways. And so I'll keep releasing Stephen King books. But then I'll also write some other books that won't saturate the Stephen King market. I'll write them under this alias. And I'll see if anybody buys these. Okay. And uh, the results of the experiment were that Stephen King was not clever enough in his hints. Or perhaps he was too clever in his hints, and people realized it was him right away. Yeah. So, so I didn't really get to carry out this experiment. But Thinner was, it was either the first or last, or this is a new phenomenon to me. I don't know a lot about this, uh, of these Richard Bachman books. That's interesting. But I always thought that was a, a great idea. And I heard that about The Prodigy, and I don't know if that's true, or if mm -hmm. somebody just said that, or what, you know, double feature That The facts, Prodigy is I mean. actually Stephen King, is that what you're saying? No, that they, uh, you know, they took that big big break after the fat of the land uh -huh. and their stuff was getting all this club play and then people would come out and they would say oh you know your new shit sucks because they're musicians and right. so everyone sure. says that about their new shit this is the new shit and so they would just release it under an alias mm -hmm. and then it got really popular and they went haha fuckers that's our music yeah so, haha, ha, fuckers, that's our music. And that's how you see MYK color logo, your shit. I think we've exceeded our number of, well, we're in a new studio now, yeah. so we can, we can reset the, the clean the slate for CMYK <laughs> color scale jokes. We can just bring it all back. <sighs> oh, that means it's time for another Robert Rodriguez, Quentin Tarantino yeah. double feature, I think. <laughs> oh, everyone's turned off the podcast. 
I also want to talk about the kid doing the Godfather impression. That was my other thing. Richard Bachman and the little girl doing the Godfather impression. Oh, I'm not yeah. really sure what I wanted to say about that, just, just that, that it's it awesome. something that happened. It's spot on, and uh-huh. I'd love to see her in a Godfather remake. Yeah. That was really it. <laughs> so, uh, what is this movie about? The movie is called Thinner. Um, uh-huh. That's what it's about. Sure. And... Would you give me, perhaps, a, is it possible, I know this is a very intricate Stephen King uh, layered metaphorical. Can yeah. you give me an elevator pitch? Can you give me a high concept? Sure, I can try. There's a fat guy who runs over a gypsy, and her husband makes him thinner till he dies. Good. I was worried this would have several sentences. I was worried you wouldn't understand <laughs> oh. high concept elevator oh, believe pitch. Believe me, I got but, it. But I think you got it. I was gonna go with there's a guy in a fat suit who gets thinner. Yeah, that would have been. I I that figured that, okay but too. I mean, if if we're really going to hook the audience, we need to give the why in the pitch. Yeah, right, because right. it's not just about it's not just about fucking Weight Watchers sure. or Atkins. Sure, it's about a guy. And the best part. Not the best part. We'll get to the best part. <laughs> sure. But one of the more amusing parts of the film for me mm-hmm. is when you start a film called Thinner and the camera eventually finds itself sitting on a man, perhaps in a fat suit with sure. a lot of fat makeup on. <laughs> sure. And the query of who's getting thinner <laughs> right. goes right out the window. Yeah. Um, we know who our protagonist is. But that that leaves, it beckons the question, what sort of diet does <laughs> sure. this behemoth go on to become the titular character? Blueberry smoothies, yeah. obviously. <laughs> First of all, fuck <laughs> this guy. Have you, ever, have you ever had a smoothie made with berries? Yes. Of course you have. You're a human being. They're awesome. Uh-huh. It's one of the best things in the fucking universe. Mm-hmm. That and peanut butter cups. Probably not a good idea to eat together. No, they're probably a uh, really good idea to okay. eat together. I think Coke Zero and peanut butter cups are kind of the perfect. It doesn't matter. Point is, blueberry smoothies are fucking awesome, and I already don't like this guy. Yeah. But that's not the miracle diet that, that gets him. <laughs> no. The miracle diet is a, um, it's roadhead. Yeah, so he gives Roadhead. No, he doesn't. And that's no, no, not no. the diet. No, he doesn't give Roadhead to a Sorry, gypsy. I can't stop he doesn't myself give bad Roadhead to a gypsy, and then the gypsy curses. I think him. we've got another movie on our hands, yeah. don't we? Fat that guy, guy. <laughs> gives bad Roadhead to gypsy, gets thinner, gives better Roadhead. <laughs> All right, so he kills an old gypsy woman by getting Roadhead. Yeah. I uh, this okay. This premise is so fucking absurd uh-huh. that the movie has to be funny. Right. Oh yeah, I think. I mean, that's the, the idea. the The film starts and just, I mean, it's probably because it's a horror movie in the '90s and just the also, general tone. There's nothing horrifying about this no. movie. Um, this is what it normals, seems like, the normals call a horror right. movie. It seems like an extended episode of Erie, Indiana. Yeah. Um, All right. That's the best way this. Can Erie, be Indiana. I, again, I know we talk about it a lot. We always hit it up when we do Joe Dante stuff. But Erie, Hell Indiana yeah. was this program in the '90s that it was. It wasn't a horror show like Goosebumps or Tales from the Crypt or Are You Afraid of the Dark. Can we give Creep Show a random shout out? Sure. I just watched that for yeah. some reason, so I feel um, the need to. It's not about horror. It's more about this bizarre phenomenon. The one episode I always think of to kind of describe Erie, Indiana is Foreverwear, where the mother's keeping her twins young by putting them in yeah, giant sure. Tupperware containers and so they that. never age. Yeah. It's kind of like that, where it's not horrifying, it's just, ooh. That's a little bizarre. Yeah, right. Um, and uh, so the gypsy, the gypsy curses him and says, "What thinner?" And lizard is the uh, other fellow. And I don't know, honestly, I don't know what happens to the potato guy. Acne, I believe it, it acne? is. <laughs> I think it's chronic acne. I don't know. That's uh, that seems more like Rusty Nails territory. So we're in this absurd. Just, I mean. <sighs> You hear all this drama about diets and weight loss. That's the drama of the uh-huh. film. And everybody's spouting out all these cancer. cliches about, well. Is your diet you have cancer? Sure. No, he's got AIDS. That's how you lose weight. You get AIDS. And then there's a point where a uh, hot gypsy's chasing him through a carnival with sure. a slingshot shouting at him. I'm really, I'm waiting for garbage day to happen yeah. through this whole film. <laughs> I just feel like maybe it wasn't really uh, Silent Night, Deadly Night, but it's right. actually from this movie somewhere. Sure. And I mean, those are in my head some of the funnier points, but 
even when they get to the um you know the white man from town uh iconography oh the white man or, from town. right i mean that itself is funny or just go ahead and you know put your curse in this pie uh -huh. i mean <laughs> remembering back the pivotal plot points from this sure. film everything is hilarious intentionally or unintentionally i mean i don't yeah. know i've got well, done i'm over that question at this point i don't know when movies are funny, I no longer care if yeah. it's intentional or not. Let me tell you something about the white man from town, Eric. Yeah. My favorite part of the movie, uh -huh. possibly the best thing this film does for me, is when the character bestows the curse of the white man from town upon the gypsy tribe. Sure. And they laugh in his face. Uh -huh. And the curse of the white man from town takes form as the mob. Right, and hiring someone else to do your work. When the white man from town curses you, the mob... Right, guns you down. Guns you down. I love it. It's, it's almost a day laborer. It's, it's my, almost the yeah. white man from down hires Machete from yeah. Home Depot to do the dirty work. It's my favorite thing about the movie, is that the white man from town curses the tribe by the mob. Right, now right. They're, now they've hurt the family. Sure. And fucking... Joe Mantegna is going to yeah. take you down mm -hmm. using not only is Joe Mantegna going to take you down, but using the exact same voice he uses for Fat Tony in The Simpsons. <laughs> sure. Right. Oh, my God. Well, OK. So while you're talking about voices, that was the other thing I wanted to get to is, uh, you know, the white man from town is one of those moments where it's funny to me, but it is the it's the film trying to be a little more serious. Sure. Um, but then you get that other. Uh, vocal piece the voiceover thing that i remember really well the dark highway you know that's that's the other side of it where the movie's trying to be really serious for a second mm -hmm. you know dear heidi and when it cuts to him giving his dear heidi dark highway monologue he's munching a bag of extreme doritos yeah. or something i mean i just can't imagine they thought they could juxtapose these things together right. and you know really carry the gravity that they wanted but I, you know, so we have this movie on paper, yeah, and maybe it's a little bit different than they plan to do it visually. Is there a way that they can do this where it isn't comedic, or is the nature of fat guy obsessed with weight really sad about his weight, trying to diet, wants to get thinner, gypsy curt? Is this always what this looks like? I don't know. I think the film would need another facet, or maybe to at least exploit the whole murder cover-up or right. what manslaughter cover-up but you think just with what's written just the written word or the stephen king richard bachman origins this is just kind of how it has to go i can't really imagine taking a film seriously where the crux of it is a man dying from not having enough substance i mean okay so to play devil's advocate here what about something like the machinist sure right i mean it wasn't weight loss in that movie but if you've seen the machinist uh was one of christian bale's films i think directly before he did the batman stuff and it's you know notable for how ridiculously fucking thin he is skeletal uh in the movie the weight that he lost for that role is a crucial component of the movie I mean, sure. the weight of that character, kind of, it goes hand in hand with the insomnia. I think that's treated in a way that's always extremely dramatic and yeah. kind of scary. So there's still, at the core, I mean, it's not a fat guy getting thinner, but it is those concepts of weight loss. Right. But I think that there'd have to be something more analogous than somebody getting skinny. Sure. That in can't, order to, that in can't order be to the entire really film. make it serious. I sure. mean, if... And scary. Well, yeah. that's the other cool thing, I guess, about comparing it to The Machinist is that is itself a horror film. Mm -hmm. This doesn't really become a horror film until he starts kissing the corpse at the end. Yeah, it's That's the first moment where I go, oh, maybe. It takes a delicious bloody pie to make this film uh, from a Saturday morning romp to a sure. Saturday late morning <laughs> Tales from the Crypt episode. I don't know. Sure. So we'll get back to the pen and paper of it. What about the uh, the moral dilemma? Yeah. That so that's think, another thing that's kind of absurd, right? I, I mean, we're is, talking about Roadhead. Yeah. Cover-up. Road it's a Roadhead co conspiracy. Yeah. It's really... Uh-huh. Um, is there a more... I mean, 
I don't know if there's really a moral dilemma here. Is there a moral dilemma I here? I don't think there's a moral dilemma. I think the question... It's not much of a cover-up. No, I think he the question is... He hits someone with the car and then goes to court for hitting someone with the car, but doesn't mention the roadhead. Right. That's the cover-up. Well, I think the cover-up is that him and the judge and the whoever is testifying all agree that he was completely innocent. Yeah. Which, the question for me is less... Whether or not he was innocent, because honestly, he did hit sure. this person and kill them. But as he says, his legal expertise is it was an accident, and if it's an accident, it's not against the law. But then, I don't really where know does manslaughter true. come up? If uh, negligence, negligence, and I suppose roadhead would be negligence. I think, yeah, it's operating a a motor vehicle. Let's while say your stuff. cock is in your wife's mouth, right? Okay. Yeah, we've all we are all familiar with roadhead. So this isn't even a road exploitation film. I thought the first time we would talk Roadhead on this show, we'd uh, get to relive some of our fondest memories via the 1970s road, but not the case today. No, they just put him naked on motorcycles. I mean, I don't know. I like that that kind of fails as a moral tale. Yeah. Here's a bunch of people who are just bankrupt human beings that you don't like anybody in the whole fucking movie except the Godfather kid. And... uh you don't even really know if what they did was that bad, but let's just make them all pretty despicable right. and then we can buy that, you know, the gypsies are out for them. Well, also, I think one of the most bizarre components of the film is the ending with the pie, despite the fact that the pie sure. becomes a slasher weapon. Sure. You put your curse in the pie. You, you curse the pie, but uh -huh. then the curse spreads. It can be anybody's curse. Right. So he right. feeds it to his wife and whatever. She may or may not be guilty. Completely not. Uh, the, the film is ambivalent. To whether or not sure. she has fucked this doctor. But then well, the... that's part of the moral dilemma, too. Uh, right. Just in, you know, she gave the roadhead. Uh, should she have known that he... Oh, let's let's uh, take the sexual element out here because it's too hard to have what a fucking sexual element? serious conversation about roadhead. Um, say she had offered him a beer while in the car or some kind of harder alcohol. And the alcohol was so good. I'm still thinking about Roadhead. It was so good, uh, hard, intoxicating. That's what it is. Uh -huh. So intoxicating that he got immediately blisteringly drunk and then hit someone. So she gave him she would be, hard alcohol and it was so good that... Well, my it, point is she would be an accessory <laughs> to the manslaughter. Yes. Sure, right. So by giving Roadhead, I suppose she is an accessory to this. I guess. If that puts him in, in dubious moral territory, I think it does her as well. Right, but I don't think that her... I don't think her morality is... No, we're supposed to hate her because she's fucking the... Yeah, yeah, if she's fucking the doctor. Right, right. But then, then when she gets her just desserts, pun entirely intended... Wow, I hate you. Um, Don't believe that just happened. The daughter also eats some pie, and that's when, oh my god, an innocent has been affected. Sure. And then that immediately goes, well, oh well, she's dead, let's kill this doctor now. <laughs> right. And the pie suddenly becomes this weapon of mass destruction. Sure. It's just, let's just feed everybody the pie. I don't like the rules of the pie, because I don't under, okay. Uh, and I feel like, were we going to make this movie more realistic? Because uh -huh. that's what we're worried about here. Um, if I'm cursed by some gypsies, yeah, and to get rid of the curse, they say I have to put my curse in this here pie. You have to bleed into the pie, and then eventually and then the somebody's got to eat this pie. Yeah, do they have to eat the whole pie? Can they eat just part of the pie and I throw it out? Do I have to make sure the pie is eaten to completion? He had a little bit of the pie he ate it yeah. off of her. I mean, I don't know. Does he die a little bit? I don't like not. Ha I feel like while you're sitting on that bench. You would probably go, hold up, I have uh, eight to ten questions about this cursed pie thing. <laughs> we should probably get this straight so I don't accidentally kill myself. Yeah. No, I don't know. The rules of the pie are really convoluted. I know that the only advice was to eat your own pie, sure. which <laughs> sure. I, I'm not sure if that's a metaphor for something. <laughs> no, I don't know I don't if it's to so. go back and say you should have given yourself roadhead There's no because layer your wife there. is innocent. There's no layer there. You just eat your own pie, man. All right, so Fright Night is another movie. Fright Night is the other, other movie. movie. Sure. 1985's Fright Night. I know you want to say 100,000 things. I really do. So I'm just going to let you have at it. All right, so Fright Night is Tom Holland's, probably his masterpiece, although I think Child's Play is more iconic. Uh, that's because hard. Between Fright Night and Child's Play, I mean... I think the iconography of Child's Play overshadows Child's Play as a film. If you look at Child's Play as a film... 
and you take away everything you know from two, three, bride and seed. Sure. Chucky is a little bit less snarky. He's sure. a little bit less hilarious. A lot of the legend of Chucky, the notorious killer doll, goes away. Sure, and we've attributed that a lot to Don Mancini sure. over right. uh, over those films. But Fright Night is where, I mean, it's it's in the '80s when vampires started to get sexy. Sure. Um, yeah. But not Anne Rice sexy. We're talking right. like weird promiscuous. It's the '80s sexy. Sure. Um, Little Lost Boys kind yeah, of. Uh, yeah, you got some Lost Boys. Um, even I think parts of Near Dark make me think okay. sexy vampires. <laughs> sure. Um, but you see something like Fright Night, and I wonder, uh, coming away from it at the end, every time I watch it, why don't we have a franchise here? That's, you know? Good, yeah. Well, there's a sequel. Yeah. So Fright Night was actually, I don't know if you can possibly believe this, but the year it came out, was the second highest grossing horror film of the year. Really? And it was ex- it was totally a surprise. Okay, Nobody, so people did yeah, see this. Yeah, people gave a shit. Yeah. The only thing, in fact, and it's a film we've done on the show, that topped Fright Night mm-hmm. was Nightmare on Elm Street 2. Oh, you know, I read that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah Freddy's I, Revenge. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Why? That is not right <laughs> at all. That's just so but wrong. But Fright Night and, and I... Yeah, people will remember that was the homoerotic yeah, uh, Nightmare on Elm Street. Right, yeah. Um, Fright Night, and this is something that our listeners can really spend too much time on, and I highly sure. recommend it for as dumb as it is. They made Fright Night into an NES game. Did they really? Yes. With what? MIDI versions of the score. No. Yeah. And Really? And you play as Jerry. Wow. And you just go around Jerry's what house. What the hell are you And you, you find about? the other characters, and you have to eat them. Wow. That's the plot of the film, and you have to eat them. The and game. If, and yeah. Well, also the film. Right. Wander and if you're, around the house. If you're, yeah. you're timed, and you have to eat all four characters every day, or you die. Wow. Um, and, and you can go on the internet and Google it and watch videos of the gameplay. And if you can possibly stand to watch it for more than five minutes, I applaud you because it looks like the single dullest game <laughs> sure. of all time. Sure. But the point I'm making here is that Fright Night was such a surprise success that they had to fast track a <laughs> shitty NES game. Oh my god. To capitalize on again, a reason that I don't understand why there's not an entire franchise oh based god, on Oh god, I miss those it's days. Probably because the sequel was apparently terrible. Um but don't that doesn't mean it was terrible. It means the internet believes it was terrible and that I haven't seen it. But I mean, uh, I want to know why there aren't a hundred thousand Fright Nights. Why Fright Night didn't do what Child's Play did? It seems like serious, untapped sequel I potential. Agree. You know what I mean? Especially characters alone. Yeah, I think uh, are enough to cause a second and third movie, and then we can just kind of go from there. I think the problem is the definitive death. Of Chris Sarandon's character. Okay, sure. Chris Sarandon plays um, the the vampire, the yeah. fucking evil sure. beast who moves in next door. Sure, sure. Chris Sarandon also, don't know if you recall, but is the police detective in Child's Play? No, not at yeah. all. That's um, funny. And uh, he plays the sexy, rapey vampire. Sure. And that's one of the most bizarre and wonderful things about this movie is he's really cool and really smooth. Yeah. And you get this idea that he can use his powers of seduction and intimidation and manipulation to really get anywhere he wants to. Yeah. Um, he gets invited into the house and sure. such and such a thing, but then he gets to like be a creepy rapey vampire sure. and sometimes <laughs> right. looks a little bit more like Nosferatu. Sure. Um, he's this wonderful blend of everything I love to see when it comes to a cinematic vampire. Yeah, right. Because we've talked from dusk till dawn. Uh-huh. And we really vampire like vampire monsters when they're the hideous yeah. and terrifying and they become a threat but a non-human one. Sure. Well, then that's when evil becomes a vampire. Sure. I mean, um, you know, Ed, he uh he's not sexy vampire. No. He's just monster teeth thing, sure. uh, vampire thing. But the other vampire, he seduces the mom. Sure. But he still has that creepy evil element. Yeah. And he eventually turns into a horrifying bat thing. Yeah, I mean, right. Everything During about the him, giant monster yeah, showdown. He's perfect. He's yeah. the perfect vampire foe. It's interesting to hear you say that because often you and I have just kind of gone, uh, romantic vampire, that's not where it's at. Right. 
you know, we did the interview and we just kind of said, let's go the let the right one in path. Sure. Just do something else. Don't want to make them romantic. But I think the edge of not necessarily a romantic vampire, but a seductive, manipulative vampire right, right. is the idea of the manipulation there. Well, and being alive forever. Eventually, oh, sure. you figure it out. Sure. You figure right. out how to manipulate people. Right. That's and it not makes a, sense. Yeah. It's not. When it's, you're first bitten, maybe you don't have that power. Right. But over hundreds Evil of years. doesn't have you, that power. Sure. But you understand uh, sure. how to seduce. You have yeah. enough tries at it. Yeah. I mean, that's eventually. Right. And every time you fail, you just eat them. Right. That's. I mean, that's. <laughs> yeah. There's no embarrassment there. Yeah, there's, a, there's an escape clause and it's you eat right. a naked 80s lady. Right. But I love using that as a superpower, you know, yeah. that's, oh, I'll just manipulate my way into this situation by seducing people. Right. And you're right. When you consider the canon of vampires, uh, we have the monster thing we like to go to. But if you're going to build uh, what I mean, it's going to sound ridiculous to call Fright Night the ultimate vampire film. Yeah. But when you consider the whole canon of vampires. Yeah. Uh, everything that they've ever done or could do or were supposed to do, all the lore and everything that's been scary or charming or whatever about them, you have something like, well, you know, you look the Twilight direction, that's an entire franchise built mm -hmm. off right. swooning vampires, sure. right? I mean, that's the entire, yeah. or all that TV shit that's on now. Right. I mean, it's all about that. And you get back to something in the 80s like Fright Night, and you're going, no, that's a power they have. Yeah. I mean, it's done extremely yeah. well. And the other thing about Fright Night that, makes it and you, this is no secret to you you know i love this in movies i fucking love suburban terror yeah sure I mean, sure there's 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 definitely a place in my heart for an urban harvest yeah right and i mean i can always be okay going out and you know having jason hang people in a barn in 3d sure out in the middle of rural bumfuck nowhere sure but I just have this love for horror taking place in the suburbs. Yeah. Because the suburbs are notoriously, and, and you and I know this. Sure. Boring as fuck. <laughs> right. And right. so it's wonderful to think that there next might be door, a romantic vampire a next door. Terrible vampire. He's going to seduce killing, your mom. Killing. Yeah. yeah. She's going to seduce your mom. He's going to kill all the sexy women you see walking right. down the street. Right. Right. He's going to lick your girlfriend's nipples. Yep. And oh I mean, my God, it man, you're immediately so right. makes the notion of suburban life this terrifying thing because sure. once something horrifying happens in the suburbs, the most uphill battle is convincing anybody else something horrible is happening in the suburbs. Sure, sure. And that's why you need your Sven Gulli character. <laughs> right. Uh, what's his name? Peter Vincent. Peter Vincent. Peter Cushing, yeah. Vincent Price, yeah. right? Yeah, but I assume there's some Christopher Lee in there oh, too. Yeah, sure. I see him and I think. You know, the, the Cushing and Price thing, I think that's more in the role than the right. actor. That's yeah, the character on paper. Sure. You know what I mean? But all that old horror yeah. monster stuff. Sure. A little tiny Bella Lugosi yeah. going on in there. He's you just, know, the whole he's, thing. He's all he's the hammer horror. He's the remnant yeah. of hammer horror in sure. the eighties. Yeah. Um a little bit less the monster and a little more I mean, you're you're right, that Vincent yeah. Price kind yeah. of guy. It's it's I mean, Fright Night the show. Not yeah. Fright Night, although there is that line. Welcome to Fright Night. Yeah. For real. Right. This is Fright Night for Play Play. Yeah. Um, and it's Roddy McDowell as sure. Peter Vincent doing the Elvira Sven Gulli. Sure. Um sure. late. He night. did a lot of what was it, Planet of the Apes he was big in, yeah. right? Yeah. He did fucking all of those movies. He's great. Yeah. Um and, and really bad old person makeup in yeah. here. That's his Yeah. Man, that's another thing. Every time I come back to Fright Night, I go, the makeup was not that bad the last time I saw right. it. <laughs> you could see the like, hairspray dusting sure. out of his hair as he Well, runs. you know what that means is it's only another 10 years until we look back at the fat suit and thinner and go, all right, what a rocking time. We're going to yeah. revisit the terrible sure. fat suit. It's going to be campy and amazing. Well, that's that's Tom Holland's thing is practical effects. Sure. That's, I mean, thinner we talked about, but yeah. Fright Night, if ever... Right. There were a quintessential practical effects Tom Holland sure, film. Sure, It's when there's this horrible dog that's been impaled <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> flopping on the God. floor. Oh, it's it's one of those moments where you watch it happen and you just, you can't figure out whether it's fucked up because 
you know it's his best friend and sure. he's dying, or if it's fucked up because it just doesn't sure. look right. Yeah, that's something Cronenberg's mastered, yeah, right? Yeah, it's perfect. The, yeah, the pile of practical effect disgust yeah. that once you finally get away from the scene, you go, oh, yeah, that was his friend, too. That is yeah. pretty messed up. And he, as he dies, he kind of changes back, and everything happening looks horrible. It's right. just one of the most fucked up, bizarre it's it's the moment for me in the film where it transcends campy 80s horror sure and actually hits a nerve in me that kind of makes me a little bit uneasy sure well and you know i feel like the movie has a good it's got its hand on camp it kind of knows that element it's more campy now because we're so far removed from it but even where the movie starts you know, the audio is camp, sure. but the visual is, and we start on that full moon and we're getting the hyper camp voiceover, mm -hmm. but it's revealed that, you know, we're actually watching, we're listening to the camp on TV, Right. we're seeing the visual that will be the film. So the film is kind of looking back and pointing to, you know, the Fright Night show in the movie and saying, here is camp, here's Hammer right. Horror, this is the serious time. And now we can look back at it, and at its best, it is one of those great pieces yeah. of camp. But, you know, further removed. Not Hammer Horror, but rather from the 80s. Right. Well, and you get these moments like, you know, the camp, like you said, perfectly represented. But there are these pangs and these moments that come in throughout the film mm -hmm. that really don't let you fully... You're not laughing the whole time. You get... One of the things for me that kind of scares the shit out of me when sure. I watch the film... Sure is uh is when they tell Brewster when the vampire tells Brewster he's not going to kill him tonight he's going to kill him tomorrow sure and i know it's kind of ooh that's spooky but when you think about it if you've come face to face if, especially looking at something like you or i or you know we're skeptics and we obviously don't believe in the bullshit of the vampire lore <laughs> the vampire yeah um you're breaking hearts out there there's I'm no sorry. such thing as vampires <laughs> But if you or I were to come face to face with something that, again, to look back from dusk till dawn, I don't believe in vampires, but I think we can all fucking agree what's <laughs> out there is vampires. Sure, sure. Um, if you or I were to come face to face with that, and then the next thing that creature said to us was, I'm not going to kill you tonight, I'm going to kill you tomorrow. Yeah. You have 24 hours to figure out how to stop something you didn't believe in until sure. moments before. It didn't even exist. <laughs> right. And so you, you start, you know, what is it? It's it's garlic and crosses and sure. all this shit. You start looking back. What do I know? What don't I know? What is real? Well, I'm always excited when they bring up the vampire in the house thing. Yeah. You know, that piece of mythology. My, uh, let's call it my relationship with vampires has changed really dramatically since I went through all the Buffy stuff. Yeah. Because before that, I was just kind of, you know, vampires are my thing, whatever. But I got excited about Joss Whedon, and that was really, I mean, that's where he started as a huge name rather than right. just having done some stuff. And I feel like this movie, I mean, I don't know if there was an influence on Buffy, but when you think of characters like Charlie's mom, sure. herself, the skeptic, and yeah. my favorite character uh, in the movie for the smaller role she plays, just being... Uh, not only the skeptic, but, you know, I love the single mom, the powerful woman mm -hmm. thing. She's kind of got that um, laxed parental styling that we saw in Poltergeist. The, uh, you know, oh, sweetie, did you have a nightmare? You want a Valium? You know, yeah. That kind of thing. <laughs> but she feels a lot like Buffy's mom from that series. And I think there's a lot of things in this movie that kind of feel like they influence Buffy. Mm -hmm. um, maybe not the the bigger romance part, although there's plenty of that. But seeing them all at the nightclub, there was a random nightclub in Buffy that all the kids, that was the, you know their home base for no fucking reason. Or uh, that scene, too, the nightclub scene reminds me a lot of that scene from Terminator. Yeah. You remember that walking in there and they're just, it's, you know, it's the 80s, so they're at a nightclub. Yeah, the nightclub scene, I think, is one of the, it's another moment that's really 80s. Um, yeah, you get, well, the music and there. well, There's an extended dance scene. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, When he proves. Extended dance scene, that's the way to put that. When he proves that his sexiness goes beyond his persona and actually transcends to sure. his moves. Yeah, right. I mean, he's just as hip as Brewster, and he can he can steal her heart just the same. Then he rips out a bouncer's throat. 
<laughs> right. <laughs> because we have to remind you it's vampires. You yeah. might have gotten uh, whisked away in <laughs> yeah. fucking dancing. You yourself may have been seduced by Chris Sarandon's charm. I think that's part of what gives a cult appeal is that, you know, we wind up in a dance club. This is very yeah. much the 80s. It's Fright Night is a fucking thing that happened in the 80s. Yeah, it really is. You know, when it came back as a remake a couple of years back, all I knew about Fright Night was, I mean, that's the reason I saw it in the first place, the original, was I saw this thing coming out and there were just posters. Fright Night, like I'm supposed to know yeah. what that is. And, you know, I talked to a lot of people who didn't start watching movies in 1999, but mm -hmm. had actually fucking seen things prior to that. Right. And they all knew what Fright Night was. Oh, yeah. I mean, it was a huge fucking thing in the 80s, or at least uh, as far as cult film well, kind of goes. Yeah, that's this thing that happened in the 80s was there are at least what I could probably think of a good handful, and we've mentioned them, of cult vampire movies. Right. In the 80s, um, Lost Boys and Near Dark and Fright Night. For some reason, the 80s was this plethora of vampire sure. films. Well, you know, these things come in waves. That was just one of them. Right. And then zombies and then back to vampires. But, I mean, what they're doing with vampires now pales so deeply in comparison Pun to number what two. Vampires in pale in comparison. Although I will say that Lost Boys definitely doesn't strike my fancy the same way that Fright Night does. My favorite thing to do for cult movies I'm discovering in recent years is to kind of watch their sequels. Well, no, to figure out why they're cult movies. Uh huh. And uh, since the first time I saw Fright Night, a big part of it, it's the suburbs thing. Yeah. I mean, it's that, but it's also that score. It's yeah. just got that, you know, it's really, really heavy, uh, new wave keyboard, 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 yep. drum machine, but also. Uh, and this doesn't happen a lot of the new wave music I listen to, so I'm excited when I hear it. Um, guitar solos. Yeah, it's so just good. Just all keyboards, all completely synthetic, and then just wailing, you know, uh, high-pitched, squeaky fucking guitar. It's this kind of it's spooky new wave. It sounds like a modern parody of yeah. 80s music. <laughs> I also like, and there's only a few of them, but listen for these the next time you watch the... Uh, the synth music cues that yeah. are in the movie in the rare moments. It's almost like the trombone thing we've made fun of uh -huh. in the past. There's that scene where Charlie's mom's introducing Jerry and, you know, there's just keyboard hits that are, mm -hmm. I mean, they're almost used to comedic effect. So there's that, there's the score, but man, Ed Evil is yeah. the other thing from oh, Friday God. Night. <laughs> I don't... What the hell is going on here? And where did he go in cinema, I think? I is, don't know. That's the real question. He went me. into that Robert England film, uh, 976 Evil. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's the only time he ever worked again. He did a couple things, but I've never really seen him and anywhere. That character, though, the character he plays needed to show up. Oh, my God. So much. What the hell? Can you believe that... Ed Evil was not a staple slasher character. <laughs> right. Oh, man. How do we not get him as the... Yeah, that's what we... Well, we've seen him before. He's the game over guy. You that's know what true. I mean? I mean, not this actor or character, but that's kind right. of the same... Yeah. Game over, man. I mean, that's Ed Evil. Yeah. Or the um, the final one is the, uh, the one that gets all cyclical at the ending, and they're paying tribute to another genre, which is kind of cool. Uh-huh. Um, the, oh, you're so cool, Brewster, yeah. you know, thing that it ends out with. And then the Fright Night theme song, of sure. course, have to end with the Fright right. Night theme. Well, the film... For when you don't want to pay Oingo Boingo for yeah, your end right. theme, just write your own Fright Night theme. Yeah, and I know you hate it, and you know I love it, but this uh -oh. is the best example of a coming-of-age film I sure. think I could <laughs> sure. ever ask for. Oh, my um, God. If I... all coming-of-age films were Fright Night, I'd yeah. be okay with that. Fucking love it. And this is the only one of Tom Holland's movies that he's ever written. Oh, really? Just yeah. Fright Night? He's a, he's a director. He's a director by trade, but a writer when it comes to Fright Night. So once again, my assertion that it may be his masterpiece. Yeah, I'll back that. We have a um, a website, doublefeatureshow.com. Uh, you can give donations, donate.doublefeatureshow.com. We get a lexicon full of stuff on there. Child's Play series, <laughs> all sorts of crazy stuff. Yeah, we did all these Paloozas. If Paloozas. you like, if you like '80s and horror, it's these killer Paloozas. And who the fuck doesn't? Also, you have a thing, GlitterMouse.com. I do have a thing, GlitterMouse.com. Never com. talk about that, but we yeah. should more. Uh, it's a band you're in. It's People a band. Can go I mean, yeah, we're, check that thing out. We're uh, we're currently in the studio working on an album. Probably have a Kickstarter. 
Ah, uh, wonderful. Yeah. If you could find it, you know, and you want to support it, do that. Definitely do that. We need more rich listeners. Send money <laughs> to you and I. Uh, and also, double feature show at gmail.com. Tell us about teen 80s vampires. Please. And I don't recommend movies, though. Fuck those people. Yeah. Why do they keep emailing us? We're not doing Blade Runner, especially next time. Uh, next time we're going to, instead of Blade Runner, mm-hmm. we're going to do Killer Clowns from Outer Space and Blood Feast 2. Oh my god, it's finally time for Blood Feast 2. It really is. Oh my god, what's Killer Clowns from Outer Space? Killer Clowns from Outer Space, it's probably just as notable as Blood Feast 2. Okay. So watch more fucking film. All right, bye. Do we, uh, before we talk Fright Night, do we talk about Michael Jackson's ghosts at all? Do you want to do that? So I don't want to get off on a Die Outward style tangent uh-huh. here, but um, I just thought you might want to talk about it because it's Stanley Winston or whatever, yeah. um, who did uh, like Jurassic Park. The visual, he was visual effects, yeah, right? right. Visual effects supervisor or... I don't know, chief. Yeah, okay. He's the guy who made the dinosaurs. Yeah. <laughs> there was one guy, not a team of people. Right. Uh, one man who made the dinosaurs, an alien and predator and terminator. In and a so world forth. where one man makes all the dinosaurs, sure. yeah, that's but um, Stanley, that's the Christian world. Stanley Winston <laughs> did a bunch of James Cameron stuff, and in the era of uh, maybe we'll do ghosts on the show. I don't probably not ghosts. Make sure you make that distinction because we will not do Patrick Swayze's ghost on the show. Yeah. I don't know. After we talk the eye, I just want to do a bunch of spooky ghost cuddle I'm movies. Sorry, man. Uh, it was in that era of Michael Jackson kind of, uh, you know, after thriller sure. was sort of a mini movie. Yeah. And then I he think like turned into a tiger at some point right. in his life. Of the long Michael Jackson music videos slash short Michael Jackson movies, I think Ghost was the longest one. Mm-hmm. It's like 40 minutes or something. Right. That's the one where Lady Gaga has a prawn in her vagina. Oh my God. I wish I could get the MIDI versions as songs, but as you'll remember from the old uh, Day of Arcade, they had no space on those cartridges. Yeah. They were literally, you know, so many kilobytes or whatever. I mean, there's no fucking space. Right. That was the the days where they spent a lot of time optimizing the code so it would actually fucking fit. And so songs, I mean, that's why every classic NES, you know, you think about old game songs. I always think of Lemmings. There's 20 seconds of, yep. if you're lucky, there's uh-huh. 20 seconds for a song, and it just loops until you go insane. So unfortunately, there's probably not enough music in there. But if somebody wants to take every MIDI track and uh, composite them together into an actual song, I would love that.